China's influence is growing around the world. The idea of the Belt and Road Initiative was to develop connectivities between China and the Global South. From energy generation in Ecuador to generational education in South Africa, the impact of China's investments now on the inside story, Belt and Road and beyond. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lee, VOA's China Abroad Editor. For the past six months, I've been working with reporters and editors here to explain China's growing influence around the world. Today, we take you inside Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. China has been funding development projects across the globe for more than two decades. An uptick in spending happened in 2013 when leader Xi Jinping proposed the creation of a land and sea initiative called, at the time, the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. This concept has evolved over the last 10 years into what is now known as the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. And observers say China's strategy to globalize may be entering a new phase. Through its Belt and Road Initiative, China has made its mark worldwide funding projects as far-flung as power plants in Ecuador and high-speed rail in Laos. The idea of the Belt and Road Initiative was to develop connectivities between China and the Global South. The bulk of Belt and Road financing has gone into hard infrastructure sectors such as transportation, energy, uh, mining, but China has now also folded a lot of their cultural initiatives, their educational initiatives, scholarships, Confucius Institutes and others into this big uh, juggernaut of the Belt and Road Initiative. The country has emerged as the lender of first resort for many developing countries. It's more China's globalization strategy. As with many infrastructure projects, there will be winners and losers. If you uh, are living right next to a highway and you don't own a car, or you are a low-income worker and cannot afford to take that expensive high-speed rail, you may have a very different view of uh, the project that was implemented in your neighborhood. China observers say that after a decade of implementing Belt and Road projects and fighting the pandemic, Beijing may be recalibrating. It is obvious to us that the era of uh, cheap money with low interest rates and large-scale mega projects is uh, likely over. A lot of these loans that they had given out uh, during the first five years of the Belt and Road era are now only coming due for repayments. And they're realizing that a lot of the projects are not as commercially viable as they thought that they might be. The impact of China's global footprint can be seen through geopolitical tensions with the U.S. The motivation for China to initiate the Belt and Road Initiative was to kind of have to, to hedge against the, the potential conflict with the, with the U.S. probably. And and so, and by doing these, all these things, by showing the kind of activism on these fronts um, through the BRI, kind of convinced um, that, convinced the U.S. and the other powers that China is ambitious. China has these um, intentions to kind of rewrite or reshape uh, the global order. The scope of Beijing's global influence has changed how the U.S and its allies see China. Some officials warn China is a threat and is no longer the world's factory of cheap exports. Europe suddenly realized that China was coming to Europe and buying up strategic critical infrastructure. It changed their perspective on China. How much China would uh, commit to BRI is uh, decided by how much it helps or works for China. They are much more likely to engage in cultural exchanges and uh, to uh, win over uh, public opinion uh, toward China. Especially in the global south, as Beijing paves the path toward an era in which China is one of the largest powers in the world. 
Like many nations, Ecuador endured energy shortages for decades. In 2006, the South American country financed a loan with the Export-Import Bank of China to build the Coca-Cola Sinclair hydroelectric power plant. From the capital, Quito, reporter Nestor Aguilera gets us up to date on the external and internal challenges the project faces. Edgar Zuniga's 80-year-old ice cream shop in Quito has seen a lot of history, including when electricity had to be rationed in the 1990s. Our freezers need to have the right temperature to be able to serve ice cream. So when we were told we were going to have two, three, four hours without electricity, for us it was a shock. The solution to Ecuador's power problem was the Coca-Cola Sinclair hydroelectric power plant, built with help from China's Sino Hydro state-owned construction company. When operating at capacity, it can supply a third of the country's electricity. The project cost more than $2 billion and was financed with a $1.7 billion loan from the Export-Import Bank of China. Since the plant's inauguration in 2016, the project has been surrounded by controversy. China lent us the money and forced us to hire a company they wanted. The state could not decide which was the best company and the best cost. The most current concern? The appearance of thousands of cracks in the plant's distributors, which conduct the water to the turbines to generate electricity. The worst nightmare a mechanical engineer has is for there to be a crack in a part. In response to media coverage of the problems with the plant, the Chinese state-run news outlet Global Times quoted Chinese embassy officials in Ecuador saying, the problem has been assessed by an international third-party independent testing agency, which concluded that it will not affect the operation and safety of the unit and that the plant is safe for its 50-year design life. In addition to structural problems within the plant, the Coca-Cola Sinclair project is also facing environmental threats. In 2020, erosion near the plant damaged oil pipelines in the region and destroyed a part of a highway. Geologist Carolina Bernal links the aggressive nature of the erosion to the way sediments are managed by the power plant. It's an area that's having more and more problems because there's a threat that due to the constant accumulation of sediments, the mechanical room will flood and we would have to be dredging all the time, removing that sediment. Local residents are disappointed by the lack of economic benefits brought by the plant. The hydroelectric project was going to generate tourism, attract more people to see the hydroelectric installations, but it didn't happen at all. Instead of money flowing into the area, repairs of the plant will cost money, as will dealing with the erosion, in order to keep the lights and freezers on in the country. For Nestor Aguilera in Quito, Ecuador, Miguel Amaya, VOA News. China's Belt and Road Initiative is not limited to infrastructure projects. Building bridges culturally is an important part of the strategy. From Cape Town, our Kate Bartlett shows us how China's educational programs are making inroads in South Africa. In the preparation for tai Chi, tea and pandas. It's Chinese soft power on display at a new Confucius Institute in South Africa. It's one of some 60 on the continent. We have a growing relationship with China, with business and all kinds of things. Um, you, they need translators and uh, we are starting to teach Mandarin in South Africa. In Africa, these institutes are welcome and growing. The first Confucius Institute opened its doors in South Korea in 2004. With the support of China's Ministry of Education, China says the institutes aim to promote Chinese language and culture. But the U.S. and Britain say the centers spread propaganda. In 2020, the U.S. designated the Washington-based Confucius Institute U.S. Center as a foreign mission. More than 100 of the centers have closed on U.S. campuses. European countries, including Sweden, Finland, Norway, Belgium and Denmark, have been closing Confucius Institutes at universities in recent years. In the decade leading up to 2022, China says it has built Confucius Institutes in 159 countries and territories, with some 500 Confucius Institutes around the globe. 
the institutes mainly operate within local universities and with sister universities in China. If you don't want to do anything with the Chinese government, then you, you can't collaborate with the universities in China. University of the Western Cape's Director of International Relations, Yumesh Bawa, says he's been warned. Well, with our Nordic partners in Europe, because we have some of them also who have um, closed down their Confucian institution and have, and have cautioned us. Be careful about, about this as being a Trojan horse. Some academics warn the institutes interfere with free speech, where some faculty may even self-censor on topics critical of China. If a university for example, you know, invites a Tibetan representative, then they might get pushback from the Chinese embassy, but and now they might also get pushback from the Confucius Institute. Singh says the concerns are unfounded. When we uh, have a Confucius Institute, we would have a local co-director, and the local uh, co-director would have control of all the curriculum and the activity, uh, the events. So we, we abide by all the laws and the rules and regulations of the local university, and our curriculum is uh, heavily scrutinized by the local faculty. On behalf of the Consulate General of the People's Republic of China in Captain, I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the official opening of the Confucius Institute. In November 2022, this Confucius Institute opened in Cape Town, South Africa, this is the sixth institute in the country. Western concerns about the Chinese institutes don't necessarily apply to the University of the Western Cape, says Bawa. We're very clear about what partnerships we make. And like everything else, we be cautious. We don't, have, we don't do partnerships with people who do not share our values. Many people in the democratic nation have been receptive to China's educational institutes due to its history with Beijing. China supported many black liberation movements against colonialism and white minority rule, which led to discrimination and racial segregation during much of the 20th century. Education programs such as Confucius Institutes, scholarships, exchange programs and vocational training help develop talent and promote cultural exchange, which are key components of the Belt and Road Initiative. In Africa, educational programs are not only limited to everyday students. Last year, politicians from six African countries attended a new $40 million leadership academy in Tanzania opened by Beijing. The aim is to train African politicians. While some analysts fear these types of educational programs will promote Chinese communist ideology, Others say not every nation shares this concern. Among African students, it isn't such a politically fraught issue uh, you know, in the global south as it is in the global north. While some countries warn China's educational initiatives are a threat to democratic values, other nations see educational partnerships with Beijing as an opportunity to benefit from China's Belt and Road projects. In Chinese. Kate Bartlett for VOA News, Cape Town. From 5G infrastructure to mobile phones, Chinese technology is used in many of the devices and applications used around the world. The technology component of China's BRI is called the Digital Silk Road. It is getting mixed reviews, welcomed by some countries, while others are assessing the potential risks of Chinese technology. From phones to computers, what connects people in many parts of the world is Chinese technology. China calls its global tech effort the Digital Silk Road. Launched in 2015, Beijing describes it as the technology dimension of China's Belt and Road Initiative with a scope that runs from the ocean into space. Germany has Chinese technology but is considering whether to ban Chinese 5G equipment. These strict checks for potential security risks now also apply to the existing components in telecommunication networks, and that these existing components will also be critically checked in the next few months. The Chinese embassy in Berlin responded that it is puzzled and strongly dissatisfied by Germany's actions. In the U.S., strong restrictions on Chinese technology started under former President Donald Trump, who cited national security concerns. 
In the UK, Huawei technology must be removed from its 5G networks by the end of 2027. Here's how China responded to the British decision in 2020. In the United Kingdom, Kingdom with no concrete evidence under the pretext of risks which don't exist at all, has cooperated with the United States to discriminate against, oppress and exclude Chinese enterprises. Security concerns over the ability for Beijing to spy with Chinese technology and control of the telecommunications infrastructure have raised alarms in some Western countries, but nations from Southeast Asia to Africa have welcomed China's offers of a cheaper path to digital connectivity, says Mayan Nowens, a Chinese security expert. So in Africa, I think the conversations are a little different as they will be in other developing and emerging economies, where the emphasis is not so much on security concerns, but predominantly on how Chinese companies can help these countries develop their digital economies. While several countries beyond China provide options for tech equipment such as phones, there is one area of digital competition where the U.S. and China are the main players, says financial risk expert Robert Green. Cloud services and, and, and cloud computing is a very um, big area to focus on. While competition between countries may happen at the geopolitical level, analysts say it also impacts consumers. Understanding this larger geopolitical um, context is really important for the average consumer to understand that we're not necessarily dealing with another government that operates uh, in the same way as our government does. As with any technology, Nguyen says consumers should think about how much they trust the tech they use and weigh the risks that technology may pose as to who is storing personal data and how the information is being used. Beijing's digital Silk Road has the potential to reshape the global economy and put the country in a powerful position around the world. It's a way for China to access new markets while gaining geopolitical leverage. I spoke to Maya Nowens from the International Institute for Strategic Studies about the impact of China's technology leverage. So the Digital Silk Road is an initiative that was launched by uh, the Chinese government in 2015. And it was seen as initially a subset of the Belt and Road Initiative. So whereas the Belt and Road Initiative looked at hard physical infrastructure projects related to connectivity, think of roads, railways, ports and the like, the Digital Silk Road was more of a different type of animal. It's, uh, a, uh, it's an effort to improve digital economies around the world and digital con connectivity around the world. So think of rollouts of next-gen telecommunications infrastructure such as 5G networks. Think of the building of data centers. Think of platforms and services like e-commerce or fintech solutions that are Chinese companies investing abroad and opening up their services to new markets. They have a saturated market back at home and really where they're going to make their profit is internationally. So this for them isn't necessarily about um, the Chinese government or the Communist Party um, expanding its influence and power around the world. For them, this is just normal business at the end of the day. The thing that uh, I think brings this into a bit of uh, tension at the moment is the question of how, what the state and the party's influence over the digital Silk Road is. The ability for uh, the Chinese government to leverage these um, technologies, um, this digital infrastructure to gain access to uh, information to data uh, for surveillance or espionage reasons, uh, concerns about potentially um, the ability uh, for Chinese companies, um, well, the ability for the Chinese uh, government to leverage uh, Chinese companies' uh, integration in national critical infrastructure in order to use that potentially in a gray zone scenario in times of crisis or conflict. in. Sub-Saharan Africa, however, when we look at the data that we've collected with China Connects, although there is a very strong narrative about digital economies being connected and building up infrastructure in these countries, um, the data seems to suggest that there are three times as many projects um, rolled out through the Digital Silk Road that focus on surveillance-related technology than on, for example, smart city technology that seeks to make living in urban environments uh, more efficient. The Digital Silk Road, as I said, would, will continue to be important for China's own, I think, national ambitions of being a science and technology superpower in the next uh, decade or so. 
um, and to be able, of course, to project that um, that that power as uh, in terms of its own um, status in the the global uh, uh, system. So whereas in the past we could argue, oh well, it's just commercial activity. Now we're actually seeing that there are values attached to that commercial activity. There are norms that are being attached to that commercial activity and that China seeks to um, leverage its relationship with, with uh, recipient countries for, um, to be able to influence and shape the uh, international system according to Chinese interests. So that's where I think we're going to see a lot of activity in the next few years. After pandemic-related delays, talk is underway about resuming work on a Belt and Road Rail project in Myanmar connecting China's Yunnan province to the Bay of Bengal, giving China a more direct link to receive Middle Eastern oil. Delays and cost overruns to a high-speed rail project in Indonesia has many questioning whether such projects are worth it. VOA's Ahadian Utama has the story from Jakarta. Every day for the past two years, Heru Sutanto says he has felt anxious. He lives in Padalarang, a city in the Indonesian province of West Java, situated some 136 kilometers from the nation's capital, Jakarta. This is what I'm really worried about. If it shifts, the roof will also fall. That's why we don't use this room. I have two rooms that are not being used for my children's bedrooms. Rather than being at risk, it's better to sleep in the living room. Sutanto's house is about 150 meters from the construction of a tunnel. That's slightly longer than a soccer field. The tunnel is a part of the Jakarta-Bandung High Speed Rail project, a landmark project for China's Belt and Road Initiative. The project aims to connect two of the region's population centers, Jakarta and Bandung, through high speed rail. The housing complex where Sutanto lives is just west of Bandung. The tunnel construction impacts him and more than 100 other families who live in this complex. The construction process uses blasting techniques so that it has an impact on the damage to their residential houses. Residents have tried several times to voice their concerns to officials with the Indonesia-China High Speed Rail Project, known by their Indonesian acronym KCIC, a consortium formed by Indonesian and Chinese state-owned enterprises. But the residents say the KCAC has not followed up. The consortium also did not respond to VOA's request for comment. At the beginning of the project in 2016, the initial cost was 5.5 billion US dollars. 75% of that amount was borrowed from the China Development Bank. Indonesian state-owned enterprises took on 15% of the cost, and the rest was provided by the Chinese consortium of state-owned enterprises. However, costs swelled to more than $6 billion and is expected to increase again to just under $8 billion due to overrun costs, according to an official with Indonesia's Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs. Transportation analysts say this development has put Indonesian President Joko Widodo's government in an uncomfortable position. The choice for the government is to keep completing it even though the economic consequences will be a lifetime budget burden. If they stop, it would probably become an abandoned project for life as well. Some residents are pushing for the project because it will drastically cut the travel time between Jakarta and Bandung. <coughs> Ahmad Rashad lives on the outskirts of Jakarta and travels to and from Bandung weekly for work. It normally takes up to four hours, but with high-speed train, I hope it can reduce to one until two hours. But even rail supporters are disappointed by project delays. The high-speed train was to begin operating in 2019, but that has been moved back to 2023. Back in Padalarang, Sutanto and his neighbors wonder how much longer their homes can withstand the constant drilling. Ahadian Utama, VOA News, Jakarta, Indonesia. Dive deeper into China's Belt and Road Initiative in our special report right there on the front page of our website, voanews.com. That's all for now. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at VOA News. Follow me on Twitter at TV one Catch up on past episodes with our free streaming service, VOA+. I'm Elizabeth Lee. We'll see you next week for The Inside Story.